right, everybody. Welcome to the Evolution Security Podcast. I am Aaron Davis, half of the Tactical Twins. Eric, once again, Joe Biden and his generals are calling the shots for Eric this evening. Unfortunately, even though he is not in the Army, they still push him around a little bit. But we are glad anyway to be here with our good friend Tim Heron. How you doing, buddy? I'm doing great. How about you? Um, I am doing great. Awesome being able to talk to you because um, when when our guests hear more about what we're going to talk about, I'll, I'll delve into that. But real quick, just some quick admin stuff. Now, October 28th. I'll be teaching our Evolution Security Defensive Pistol 1 class here in the Tulsa area. Go ahead and go on to Eventbrite, and you can hunt that down and come and train with us. It's going to be a a blast, a great concealed carry focus class. And we want to implore you as listeners to go out to iTunes and rate and review our show And then, of course, share the show to your friends and tell them they can listen to it anywhere there are podcasts you can get get our show. So we really appreciate the help in getting the show out there. So now, Tim, I recently, after after going through surgery, I've been our audience knows that I've been recovering from neck surgery. I don't know if you can see my my scar there. Oh, yeah. And I've been getting my strength back, getting, I just got released about a month ago to, to shoot matches and um, go to jujitsu and stuff. And I started shooting and then realized that my next match, it's like, man, I'm going to need, I'm going to start hitting a match every weekend. Now I I know for, for heavy hitting um, competition shooters, especially in our area, you know, they're at every daggum match that's available right but it, i couldn't think of anyone better to talk to about my new kind of switch and focus in in you know basically making competition my number one um, focus right now than you and and what was cool was i i believe in early august you had a match skills clinic um and i saw a little bit about s- something about that, but I want to talk about that if you'd like to here in a little bit. Sure. Um, is that something that you, I, I want to touch more on that in a bit, but is that something you're starting to do on a continual basis? Um, I've been teaching Matt Skills Clinics, uh, which is kind of a one day class, um, either in conjunction with like one of my more, my, like my flagship two day class, practical performance, or like in, in conjunction with like maybe another one day, like diagnostics and, and like handgun diagnostics and foundations class. So, um, actually match skills clinics are kind of where I got my start, uh, you know, from a, from a teaching aspect. Um, I started doing those kind of like four, uh, four hour or six hour kind of classes in conjunction with a match, um, and, and open it to about five to five to eight students oh, that's and cool. work throughout a, throughout an entire day. So it's, it's something I've been doing basically since I started teaching in 2015. Um, and it, it's kind of, I mean, it, I don't want to say they've, they've taken a back seat. They're just, obviously it's a little harder to, uh, to justify the travel, you know, uh, to go to a place for like just a one day kind of match sports clinic, you know, unless you, you price it, unfortunately, so exorbitant to, to cover the cost of travel and hotel that, uh, you know, then students are now paying like five or $600, you know, for a one day, eight hour class. And that's, yeah. that's just not conducive to, to good business. It, it doesn't make good sense to do that. So sure. um, it's something I've always offered. And it's definitely something that like, more people started to hear more about again. And uh, it's, it's become more, more popular again here just in the, in the past, you know, year, year and a half, two years of time. Oh, cool. Well, it sounds like, sounds like something I would be interested in if, if you ever come near me or um, I'm out that way now. So, what I would like to at least, again, so we're we're going to focus a lot on on competition, the the benefits of competition. But I wanted to start out with a story, and it, it's nothing new. the The instructors out there that are there out there that are for some reason anti competition. It, it's just kind of goofy. 
but I, I've got one story where it was super cool. My wife hunted down a local class that she wanted to take. And I thought, hey, that's cool. I'm going to just, I'll go with her because she found this class she wanted to take. Sure. And it was put on by a a local law enforcement, ex-law enforcement guy. And right off the bat, he was, he made it clear that he wasn't too cool on competition. And, and I, I j- it, it was funny because at one point he was watching me shoot and pointed out to the rest of the class, hey, you can tell this guy's a competitor. Look at, look at his slide staying flat when he shoots. I'm like, okay, that's kind of you're contradicting yourself <laughs> there. But, but, you know, it, I'm, I'm kind of digressing a little bit about the way he taught the class. And this is where I like being able to offer the classes that we offer at a local level, because <clears throat> a lot of local classes are like this one that we went to. Mm-hmm. All these people that are a lot that are, you know, barely above beginning students and the main parts of the class were, you know, shooting between our legs, supine and um, doing tourniquets and and then shooting outside of vehicles and and getting a lesson in the A, B and C frames for cover, etc. But. There was no talk about what the average citizen needed to focus on at f- in carrying and protecting themselves. So it was just weird to have this this kind of disjointed class, and then he's got this attitude against competition. Mm-hmm. So so I'm I'm kind of going back to the fact that you know to most people not, most people that I trust look up to that are mentors believe that competition in everything from jujitsu shooting, anything that you can do is going to be beneficial. Even if you're it's, you're not 100% into it, trying to be a professional, et cetera. So, you know, I, I wanted to talk about what you feel the importance of competition is for every shooter, every type of shooter. Could you maybe touch on that? Sure. I mean, I, I definitely, I, I mean, a strong believer, you know, and a, and a hundred percent advocate on, um, indulging in competition, especially, you know, with the shooting sports. Um, most of all, I mean, regardless of your actual interest in competing, um, it's a great way to test your skill set under some acknowledged pressure. Right. Um, and, and that's something that you don't get to do you know, a lot of guys are like, oh, well, you know, you go to the range and you use a timer, a timer will give you all the pressure that you need. Well, but it doesn't, it doesn't Mm -hmm. give you the, it doesn't give you the pressure that you do when, you know, you're shooting on a squad of 12 to 15 other people and you're, you're in kind of direct competition with, you know, with particular, you know, particular shooters. Um, You know, you're trying to do your best. You're trying to, and you get one opportunity to do it. Whereas, you know, like if you're out on the range, I mean, I run, I I use a timer exclusively when I'm on the range, you know, almost for everything that I do. And the timer does give you a little bit of a a little bit of pressure, but not like knowing when you go to a match and you shoot a match, you've got one chance to do your absolute very best that there's no do overs. Right. So I, I, I feel like a lot of that does uh, relate to, you know, let's say to judicious use of a firearm, you know, in a, in a defensive situation, you don't, you don't get multiple attempts, you know, like the, the multiple attempts come with practice to make you better so that, you know, in that most important fight for your life, you know, that I hope that nobody ever has to go through, they're able to perform at a, at a level that allows them to, you know, to kind of win the day. Um, and, and nothing really else out there other than competition is going to give that to you, um, you know, with the exception of certain force on force, you know, types of scenarios and things like that. And it's definitely not to detract from force on force, but the problem with force on force is you've got to generally travel a long distance to find an instructor that teaches force on force. Uh, the equipment for, for that is, you know, it pretty, pretty expensive. Um, it's not like you're just going to go out and go buy a case of, uh, you know, little blue pills or whatever for a, you know, for a blue gun, you know, to mm-hmm. run your own force on force scenarios and things like that. And then you also need people to, 
you know, to, to kind of role play the different situations. Whereas in competition, you can find a match almost any day of the week, any evening of the week or any weekend within a, you know, a, a 30 minute to a, an hour and a half drive of your, mm-hmm. of your house um, and be able to shoot in anything from steel challenge to IDPA to USPSA to, you know, even like even remote outlaw matches, you know, mm-hmm. someplace to, to at least kind of dip a toe in the water. And it gives you an opportunity to kind of, like I said, to test your metal, you know, how good you are, you know, on a, on a one and done kind of course of fire. And also to be able to pressure test your equipment, you know, how good is my holster? How good is my mag pouches? How good is my pistol with a less than, you know, a, a subpar grip? Um, you know, how good am I uh, at being able to align the sights when I have to lean around, you know, a hard wall or a barricade, or I have to shoot between targets, or, you know, I have to do other things that are being time pressure tested. And that that's where, I mean, if, if you're advocating that we shouldn't, and I'm not meaning you, I'm, I'm talking yeah. to an instructor yeah. and you're advocating that, uh, you know, that, that you shouldn't pursue competition in some way, shape or form. I mean, I hate to say it, but kind of get with the times because you're doing it wrong, you know? Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. And I would say definitely that, that it's a red flag to me to not spend any time or money with those individuals, but you know what? That's not a big deal because in, in if you just want to talk about, let's say the range master world, um, everybody, let, let's say that, that teaches at TACCON or, or, or all this, this, this world of, like-minded people, I can't really think of anybody that, that doesn't advocate competition. It it really just seems, it really just seems to be the the local guys, you know, like I was saying, you know, uh, Tom Givens, you know, was like, I want to say he's life member of IDPA. He's like life member number four. Mm -hmm, Um, mm -hmm. you know, the, the IDPA target as it exists right now, currently, you know, with the eight inch circle for the the center mass of the chest with, uh, you know, that, I mean, that was all kind of picked out and designed by guys like, you know, Bill Wilson, Ken Ackathorn, Tom Givens, who mm-hmm. were the originators of IDPA, you know, I mean, it, and Tom not only obviously has a very, very, you know, prominent background, you know, as a, as a law enforcement, you know, and, and retired, you know, law enforcement with, uh, with Memphis PD for, Jesus, what, 180 some years? I don't know how old the, I don't know how old Tom is. Say a while. 71 now. <laughs> right. But uh, but you know, at the same time, I mean, he was he was one of the kind of the grandfathers of, you know, kind of what what is modern day competition with IDPA. So, I mean, you know, when you've got the majority of shooters that even go and teach or instructors, instructors that go and teach at the tactical conference every year. Um, have competed in some way, shape, or form, or do currently compete, that kind of tells you a lot about, you know, whether or not it's important um, for you as an individual, you know, again, to kind of pressure test your, pressure test your skill set. And that's, there's no better way to do it. Hey, and and speaking of, you're reminding me, of course, of the competition at TACCON. Sure. Now, um, which, which was a lot of fun. I, I'm glad I got to shoot it. You know, I didn't make it up there in the Top 16, not even close, but hey, uh, it, it was a blast getting to be a part of it and and seeing all you guys, you know, put your put your skills right there, um, mm-hmm. you know, in front of everybody, too. I mean, that 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 must have been a lot of pressure, too. So, no, it's it's always it's always good, you know, and the, and the great thing about even that little particular, you know, kind of small match there at TACCON is it gave me, you know, it gives me an opportunity from a guy that actually shoots obviously primarily a lot of gun games and, and competitive shooting um, to kind of pressure test my skill set, you know, from uh, appendix, you know, from a concealment, um, mm-hmm. you know, with a gun that I probably don't, you know, I spend a lot of time carrying it, but I don't spend as much time training with it as I do, obviously, you know, my, my competition guns. Um, and it's a great way to be able to pressure test and say, like, see, even though I don't spend, you know, a majority of my time with my, you know, with my carry gun, you know, as far as training with it, I'm still able to compete at a very, very high level, even with my competition, or I'm sorry, mm-hmm. with my carry rig, because of the fact that I spend a lot of time shooting competition and training and just training and getting time behind a gun, period, is, is extremely valuable. Well, I like to to explain it to people that 
have not gotten into competition, dip their toes into it. To me, one of, one of the key issues is that I really can't think of a better way to hone gun handling skills, manipulation of the firearm, safety, muzzle awareness, um, just so many things. T- to me, I feel like it's not the exact same as going to the range and, and focusing on a handful of drills for the day, you know, right. or, you know, two or three, like we normally would. But to me, I feel like I'm, I have shot, you know, three times at the range every time I shoot one match and, mm-hmm. um, you know, maybe even more than that. And that's, to me, that's one of the biggest benefits, especially for newer shooters. And, and and I try and explain to some of my friends that are not serious shooters and they, they do want to get better, but they're scared to go compete, you know, like everybody, not scared, but, sure. but intimidated. Mm-hmm. Um, they want to get better before they go. But then you, know, you go to a local match. There are literally people that walk and pop, pop, right, pop. And then there's pros that eat at local matches, right? Mm-hmm. Everyone is there, and every single one of those people wants you there, no matter how good you are. Oh, exactly. Right? I, I try to get that across. You know, sometimes it feels like people, are like, yeah, 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 I hear you, but I don't. You know. Well, the the thing about competition, right? So, I mean, it does it gives you an, an added benefit, obviously, of more time behind the gun. It gives you an opportunity also to learn how to problem solve, um, you know, with a gun in the hand. So, you know, like how to how to figure out particular kind of situations. You know, you're presented with a problem or a puzzle, you know, mm-hmm. if, if, in just in kind of gamesmanship speak. You're presented mm-hmm. with a puzzle and it's your job to solve that puzzle as best as you possibly can, you know, with with a pistol in hand. You know, so I mean, every skill set really is tested, uh, shooting from odd positions, uh, movement with the pistol, you know, um, how you address each array, you know, with the pistol, um, how, how good you can grip the gun for an extended, you know, extended period of time, um, how good your shot splits are, how good your shot calling is, how good, um, how good your transitions are, tra- you know, moving the gun or, or, or shooting target to target and transitioning the gun. All of those things are, are tested in a competition. I will say though, you know, kind of the caveat to that though, is a competition is not practice, nor should it replace a practice session, Mm -hmm. right? But what a competition will do is it exploits weaknesses that you may have in your own shooting, right? Just like a test does. So if you think all the way back to like high school, you know, um, and when you think about high school, your first day of of a class in a semester, the teacher might give you a pop quiz, you know, and the pop quiz may not make any sense to you at all, but you're you're taking a quiz so that the teacher or that so that you can also kind of determine your knowledge beforehand on a particular subject before you dive into it for the semester to study it, right? Mm-hmm. Think of a competition as doing exactly that same thing. Going to your first competition is going to exploit both your strengths and your weaknesses. It's it's going to allow you to be able to find out, okay, where am I good? And where am I not so good? So that you can take the things that you're not so good on and it empowers you to then be able to take those things and go back to your own practice, uh, whether it be both in dry fire as well as in live fire to practice those particular things to improve upon those. So that then the next time that you go to a match, right, then you're, uh, you're, you're testing yourself or quizzing yourself again on all of the homework that you have done and studying um, to get better, you know, or to improve yourself within those, within those things that you, that you're, that you're being tested on. And every week or every month, depending on how many matches that you go to, you know, kind of you're being tested on different particulars that allow you then of course, to take that information and and take it back home with you to then further study and practice at. Right. And that's how we get good. We, you know, the matches are tests so that we can start evaluating ourselves better and studying better for those tests, both in dry fire and live fire, uh, when we go to the range to just practice, we know what to practice, how how to practice, and why we're we're practicing the things that we are, right? So now we have purpose to our practice, so that we can start mm-hmm. the implicit, you know, improvement in our in ourselves, and that's what competition gives us. That no amount of classes, 
no amount of force on force, no amount of these other things that we we hear all the time. And we get, we, I mean, you and I both know multitudes of folks that are like class junkies. You know, they'll spend mm-hmm. four or $500 to go take a two-day class and they'll shoot three or 400 rounds or five or 600 rounds or hell, even a thousand rounds in a, in a two day or three day class and basically kind of fib to themselves and say, yep, I got better. I'm a much better shooter because of this class than I was beforehand. And I would challenge that you didn't probably get better from the instruction or from the class. You got better simply from the repetition of shooting Mm -hmm you know, a multitude number of rounds over a, you know, kind of an extended period of time. Now, granted, you are, you know, with, with instruction, you know, or classes you are getting, I hope, you know, with a particular instructor, you know, you're being able to hit on the, on the things that you need most. And that instructor is able to, to kind of deep dive along with you to, to kind of give you some guidance and, and leadership into where you yourself need to improve. But the class doesn't make you better. The class just gives you it gives you an education. It's what you do with that education outside of the class, whether it be in your own dry fire, your own live fire, or even in then t- attending matches that allows you to start implementing the things that you've learned in a class to get better. Well, and, and I like that you brought up the, the issue with classes and yeah, I mean, I think both of us, fall into that category of being class junkies, right? I mean, you just don't live in this world without at least having that in your DNA. But after TACCON, my brother and I both said, you know what? We've been taking quite a few classes these last couple of years. Mm -hmm. We need to simply take a break from classes depends on what type of class but especially shooting okay just just shooting classes we're going to take a break and we're going to we're going to really digest and test and um, work out all these things we've learned from these great instructors over the last year <clears throat> year and a half and so I am doing that and I'm focusing, like I said, I'm starting this focus on competition, trying to hit a match about every week. Mm -hmm. And the, the and it literally was my first match back Mm -hmm. after, after not being able to shoot, um, for three and a half months and Mm -hmm. then not having been at a match for about five months. And I took that, I went to that match and instantly thought, okay, I have a few areas that I can focus on right now that will make huge dividends in my competition, right? right. In, in how well I do. And the the number one thing I went away with was my single hand shooting. Mm-hmm. I, I know that's kind of trite, but you know, I, I can perform pretty well with two hands. I can move fairly well. I can negotiate the, the, parts of the puzzle, but when, and it also has to do with my grip strength because of my neck, I lost a lot of strength, Mm -hmm. but I could probably class up just by getting my, um, not probably, I know I could class up if I just improve my single hand shooting. Sure. So right now when, when I go to the range, I'm spending at least half of my rounds on, on single handed shooting. I mean, man, it, it, it's frustrating, but it's just, it, especially, you know, you're left-handed, but uh, on my left hand, it's so foreign mm-hmm. and, and it's like, it just feels so uncomfortable just to even get the finger right on the trigger. Right. Even though in a competition, I'm, I may be down. I think the last, um, the last stage I was in that was, was a standard stage in IDPA that was all single handed shooting. I think I was only down two points for me. That was awesome. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, it was fairly slow and still uncomfortable, but that that's one of those things. Like you said, you go there, you, you figure out what you need to work on and, and then you can, It may be something like that that is a vast difference between your skill sets. Um, And so, you know, I'm excited about that. But I did want to. So you got to forgive me, Tim. You're in Arizona also, right? I'm in New Mexico. New Mexico. I I knew. 
I knew it was close to there, at least, um, at least in my mind going through those places. But, um, so a lot of people know, and I've talked about it here, Oklahoma is actually a great place. If you want to be a competitor, there's like you said, now there may not, I'm curious exactly how many, you know, your take again, I think you mentioned it. There's just lots of matches going on, but yeah, here there's probably three matches going on every weekend within an hour, within usually about 30 minutes from me. Then I can go about an hour. Right. And then there's, there's some in an, another state in Arkansas that's two hours away. Mm-hmm. So between all those, and then I just found out there's a practical rifle competition not just PCC, but I can go out and compete with my, my AR. I'm looking forward to trying that out too. Oh yeah. But, but yeah, there's, there's, there's just so many opportunities to shoot here or compete here. But like where Eric lives for some reason, um, right there around Fort Bragg or Fort Liberty, they call it now. Mm-hmm. There's not that much opportunity. So there, so you're saying there's near you, there's quite a bit of competition going on. Just to competition you know, culture. anywhere I've lived, um, I'm, you know, the majority of my life I spent in Kansas city. So about mm-hmm. four hours North of Tulsa, um, mm-hmm. you know, Kansas city, Missouri. And in Kansas city, I could shoot every Tuesday night at an indoor match. I could shoot every Friday night at an indoor match. I could shoot every, just about every Saturday at an outdoor match. Um, and then I think like the third or fourth Sunday of the month, there was also an outdoor match at a different club that was on a Sunday. So, I mean, all in all, I could shoot about three times a week, um, different days of the week and shoot competitively. Um, I chose not to do that because I think too many people, you know, they, they get the bug a little bit, you know, they're like, Oh, I'm going to compete. And they go and they shoot one match and one match. It, it becomes so much, so fun that they shoot nothing but matches and mm-hmm. matches become a replacement for their actual, you know, range or practice time. And I, I feel like if you're doing that, you need to take a break from matches and maybe pick one or two of those matches a month that you really enjoy shooting that you feel have the best benefit of testing you. And then mm-hmm. the rest of the time spend on a range, you know, once a week or so going to the range and just practicing or focusing uh, your attention on, you know, one or two aspects of your shooting that you, you've, you've deemed necessary that need work. Um, but yeah, I mean, here in New Mexico now, I've, I've been here five years and uh, I could shoot an IDPA match almost every week. I could shoot a USPSA match every other week. Um, there's also uh, there's a couple of outlaw matches I can shoot uh, that are like twice a month. Um, I'm sorry, twice twice a month on the USPSA matches too. Twice a month on outlaw matches, and then uh, I could shoot an indoor match. You know, whether it be an outlaw or a USPSA style match, mm-hmm. um, about once once a week or once every couple of weeks as well. So, um, and granted I'm not home enough to be able to compete, you know, to that level anymore, um, Mm -hmm. with my travel schedule and teaching schedule, I'm good if I get to shoot, uh, I think this year I'll have shot seven major matches and maybe Mm -hmm. three local matches, uh, Mm -hmm. throughout the entire year. So maybe a total of like 10 matches, uh, you know, kind of across the country. Well, but, but, you know, for, for a lot of people, that's a heck of a lot still. And in between your shooting, right? I, sure. I mean, your, your instruction and, and your maintaining skills too. Like, like for me, my focus, I am probably, I think realistically, I'll be able to hit a match every week. Mm-hmm. And not, excuse me, every week, but I'm probably going to only hit about three matches a, a, a month. But it's because I, I see, how much quicker I'm going to be able to, I just need more exposure to all the problems that you need to solve. Sure. So I don't get hit with PEs, you know? Right. Oh, I forgot about that. Oh, here you go, Aaron, three points down or five, you know, right. <laughs> whatever. <clears throat> but so it, it is, it is really cool. Sometimes I feel like I, I rub it in my brother's face, you know, about how many, competitions I can go to, but, you know, I guess it would be a good, good time to talk about, well, I I almost skipped this two things. Do you have like a mini mantra or anything like that? You, 
you say or, or think about right before the buzzer and um, what, what's your process of visualization? Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it, I, I do have a mantra that I, I, you know, or kind of a mission statement that I, uh, that I, you know, both I, I, I repeat over and over and over. And it's also what I consciously think about, you know, or consciously focus on, um, every time I'm, I, I step up to a stage to shoot and that mm-hmm. is simply grip the gun and manage the sights. Um, I, you know, if I don't tell myself to grip the gun, then Lord knows I won't grip the gun very well. Mm-hmm. Managing the sights for me. Um, you know, a lot of people are like, ah, grip the gun, see the sights or, you know, aim for every shot. And for me, you know, aiming or seeing the shot, seeing the sights doesn't tell me enough, like what visually managing the sights mean. Um, you know, for, so for me, you need to find a, a kind of a, a statement or a mantra that you can speak that speaks volumes to you about like what, what it is that, that you truly need to focus your, you know, focus your attention on. Um, you know, so gripping the gun is, is one of them because without gripping the gun, I can't manage the sights very well, but managing the sights to me, you know, kind of implies obviously seeing a sight picture an acceptable, not an exceptional, but an acceptable sight picture for every single time that I press the trigger. So whether we're talking 50 yard steel or we're talking three yard paper targets, you know, I need to see the sights in some way, shape or form for every single press of the trigger to ensure that I can call every shot and know that every shot that I'm sending down range is, is an acceptable shot and an accountable shot. So that's kind of the mantra that I speak um, to myself and, and kind of, you know, go over and over and over in my head um, as I, even as I'm shooting a course of fire. And as mm-hmm. far as visualization, it really just kind of depends on the stage. Um, but, you know, for the visualization sequence, I need to walk the course, you know, or walk the stage a couple of times to be able to know where all the targets are at and from which, which position I'm going to shoot each of the target arrays from. Um, once I can do that, and I'll walk the stage, you know, enough times to be able to, to kind of memorize exactly where I want to go, how I need to get there, um, you know, and, and, and in which order I'm going to shoot the stage or shoot the targets, then I will come off the stage and I'll turn a face up range and I'll close my eyes and Mm -hmm. I will play back in full detail, every single aspect of that stage run, um, both in first person, as well as kind of what it looks like from like third person point of view, you know? Mm. And then if I, there's a particular target and, for me, the visualization goes in depth uh, to the point where I need to be able to visualize and see every spot on the ground that I plan on getting my feet to, um, every spot on every single target that I plan to superimpose the sights to before I press the trigger, how the sights are going to lift and how the sights are going to return to that same spot on the target for the second shot, um, what targets have no shoots on them, what targets have hardcover on them. Uh, what targets are partial targets or open targets, um, how aggressively I plan on shooting each of those targets. All of those things are kind of, are, are, you know, like you go through the mental gymnastics to ensure that no time is left behind when you're, when you're shooting the stage. And then if for some reason I can't visualize, I close my eyes and visualize that entire process, I go back and I walk the stage again. And I go back and walk the stage again to pick up those little pieces that I, I, you know, I might've dropped someplace in my mind that I, you know, I had a hard time. Okay. Was that the no shoot target? Was that on the left side of that array or was it right in the middle of that array? And I'll go back and look at it again. Oh, okay. That was the second target on the inside left of that array. Okay. Then I go back and I close my eyes and I visualize the stage again. And I need to be able to visualize it in that great a detail every single time before I step up to the plate then and then shoot the stage. And then two, two shooters or so before it's my turn to shoot. So like when I'm the, uh, when I'm the shooter that they call in the hole, right? So you'll have like, Aaron is our shooter. Eric is on deck and Tim is in the hole. So mm-hmm. like when Aaron is the shooter and I know Eric, let's say your brother was the on deck shooter. Mm-hmm. I am not going to go down range and paste when I'm the, mm-hmm. when I'm the, the, in the hole shooter, it's time for me to make sure that all of my equipment is accounted for all my magazines have the requisite number of rounds they need to have in them. Um, that I can close my eyes again. I'm going to visualize every single position on the stage, every target on the stage, how I'm going to, you know, in, how I'm going to engage every position on the stage. And then, of course, by then you'd have you've gotten done shoot, uh, gotten done shooting. 
Um, Eric is now he's the next shooter. He's up now. I'm the on deck shooter. And again, when I'm the on deck shooter, after Eric would finish his his run, now I get one last walkthrough, and I'm going to walk through that stage. And as I'm as I'm walking through physically walking through the stage, I'm getting a a mental image as well as a a true visual image of okay, is that spot that I have so hardly visualized? Is it does it look exactly the same when I actually get to that spot? And you know, put put all of these different arrays and pieces of the puzzle together. And if it does, awesome. Now I go back. I await instructions from the RO. The RO, you know, it will tell me, of course, you know, um, if you got no questions, you know, load and make ready. So that's my time to go ahead and load the gun, make it ready, you know, and then put the gun back in the holster. And then before I take my hands off the gun and put myself in that full ready position, I'm running through that stage one more time, fully visualizing every single target and every array as I see it in my mind. And then, of course, then I open my eyes. I kind of stare a gaze off it in whatever direction I'm going first or whatever target I plan on engaging first. And then I relax my hands down at sides or, you know, raise my hands above shoulders or whatever the case may be. And I wait, are you ready? Stand by and the beep. And then on the beep, it just becomes execute kind of at a subconscious level what you visualized throughout your, you know, throughout your walkthroughs and throughout your visualization procedure. And then the only thing that I am, I am, consciously thinking about is again, gripping the gun, managing the sights, gripping the gun, managing the sights so that I'm ensuring that I'm, I'm giving the same visual focus and, uh, and, you know, importance to every single or priority to every single target on the stage. So uh, I keyed in on something, um, that you said, you know, of course I, I that's, uh, I mean, most people I know, of course, I think even they'll say that sometimes it matches, you know, Hey, if you're, if you're on deck or in the hole, yeah, you don't need to be out there pasting, but I'm assuming what you're talking about, you're walking through when everybody's pasting, uh, assuming that, is that correct? If I'm the on deck shooter. So if I'm the shooter, that's, that's getting ready to shoot. Yes. Then I walk the stage one more time. If mm-hmm. I am two shooters back from being the shooter on deck, no, I'm, I'm either pasting or I'm back in the back visualizing. I, uh, you know, it's, it's not my prerogative to walk the stage. It's, it's the shooter that's on deck. It's his, mm-hmm. it's his stage yeah. to walk at that time. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I, I'm going to have to try and sneak that in because I don't, I don't think I've ever noticed any, you know, I've only been at local matches and I went to state once, but, um, but I definitely, um, I don't think I've noticed people kind of, maybe, maybe they are and they're just being more sneaky about it. I don't know, but I, I will say this, re- interject this, um, a, f- a friend of mine that's been around here and I, th- um, pretty, pretty good high level shooter himself, a guy named Eric Fusion. Mm-hmm. He, he puts on a, he, cre- he built a range and he's been putting on, um, matches. I, I went to my first match at his place a couple weeks ago. Mm-hmm. And what was cool is usually local matches, they don't provide the stages um, beforehand. But but Eric, being um, a, at least semi-professional shooter, he's used to that. So he provi- provides at least, you know, the, the match layouts and everything in, in their little PDF forms. Man, I, I love that. Now, do you are you usually able to get that at most of the matches you uh, go at to? Major matches, yes. Local matches, no. Um, mm-hmm. At major matches, though, I pay no attention to them. Oh, okay, I, I Interesting. think it's I, I, for for me personally, it's a waste of resources okay. because the stages as they look on a on a book or on a piece of paper are not how the stages look mm-hmm. when you get to when you get to the local match or whatever and get ready to shoot them. So the only thing I look for, like in a matchbook, it would possibly be um, if there's any kind of oddball start positions, you know, is it mm. a seated start? Is it an unloaded start? Is it the mags are gun on table or starting on barrels? Or, you know, do you get to start with the, with the you know, gun loaded and holstered and your hands relax at sides? Are, you know, are you facing up range? Is it going to be a turning draw? Things like that. Other than that, um, I, I, I don't pay much attention to the stage briefings, you'll see a lot of guys that'll come out, you know, with like a, a stack of paper in their hand, you know, and they're, and they're drawing little, little pencil marks. Of, okay. This is how I'm going to shoot this way. And then, Oh, yep. So they have ahead of time, you know, they've looked at their entire map and they've mapped out how they think they're going to shoot every single stage. Yet then when they get to the match, they'll look at it and they'll be like, this, this doesn't even look the same. It's like, well, of course mm-hmm. it doesn't look the same. So don't, 
don't spend a whole lot of brain power trying to break down stages on a piece of paper because when you see them in like full, you know, three dimension, they're going to look completely different than what they look like in, you know, in one dimension or two dimension on paper. Yeah. And, and one thing to note that there was one where it, it was a bunch of um, partial targets mm-hmm. and you, and you had to shoot around the, these same targets around a few um, cover positions. And it seems like they had them at like in the, in the um, match, what do you call them? The, in the, in the, the, the written stage briefing, right? Yeah. In that, I think the targets were like 15 yards away, which of course is is pretty spicy in some stages, especially with partial targets. Mm-hmm. But when I got there, I think the targets were like seven yards away. Right. <laughs> so, so big difference because I went in there thinking, man, th- this one's going to be a challenging stage. And it was actually one of my best stages because it was a little easier than I I had thought it would be. But right, you can't judge distances based on anything in a in a written stage briefing, too. So they don't they typically don't give you like what the what the distances of the targets are. So if you see something and the targets look small, you might perceive that as like, oh, that target's going to be way far away. Well, no, it's just the computer program that they use to just throw some targets out there on the piece of paper to make them, you know, to to give you a stage brief. I like I said, I don't. I don't put any thought into, into those things at all. Um, I'd rather not, I'd rather not kind of muddy up my brain with trying yeah. to think ahead of time, what the stages are going to look like, because I don't want to come to a match with a preconceived notion that something is hard or something is easy. Man, that, that that's, that sounds like a good tip. I bet you talk about that in your, in your clinic. I do. <laughs> well, so, so then that this, there are some competitors I'm not going to name his name because he, he's got me pissed off recently, but um, that are, are down on IDPA or they, they, they only like IDPA or USPSA. What, what are your thoughts on that? Do you have a favorite um, match style? Or? Well, I, I primarily have shot USPSA for a number of years. That's really where kind of my background stems from, but I'm also an IDPA master um, I've been shooting IDPA matches. I think it really is going to be dependent on the kind of the location of where you live and what the matches mm-hmm. in your area consist of. So, um, in Kansas city, we had one IDPA club within like a two or three hour drive. Mm-hmm. So it just didn't make any sense to go pursue a lot of IDPA matches because the, the predominant discipline to, to shoot were, was USPSA. Um, you know, fast forward then of course, you know, five years, you know, later, what, five years ago, I moved to, uh, to New Mexico <clears throat> and New Mexico, you know, is more predominantly IDPA focused, um, here in Albuquerque, um, and not so much USPSA focused. Now we've seen a shift, um, kind of over the last like three or four years where USPSA is starting to pick up the, you know, kind of pick up the pace, so to speak, um, over the IDPA crowd, but IDPA is still, a, you know, kind of a higher priority of focus for a lot of the competitive shooters in this area, um, with USPSA kind of being secondary. Um, so I would, I get to shoot probably more IDPA matches than I do USPSA matches here. If I chose to, um, Mm -hmm. uh, like I said, my preference is still USPSA, but I, I still like, I shoot IDPA matches as well. I think they can test, um, you know, they can offer the same kind of tests that uh, a USPSA match can, albeit with a little less freedom. Um, whereas in USPSA, you're basically given a stage and then it's up to you to kind of solve the entire problem. Whereas in IDPA, you're given a stage and then, you know, the, the range safety officers will tell you which order you need to shoot, which targets in. And, you know, um, you know, you have to slice the pie, you have to do this, you have to shoot these targets in tactical sequence. And Mm -hmm. and some of those things I think are a little, a little gimmicky, a little gamey, Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. they kind of hold shooters back, so to speak, but I think IDPA is probably the best. Um, it's probably the best intro matches to get mm-hmm. people involved in because it requires the least amount of equipment, um, and it's the easiest to kind of navigate through a match. Uh, whereas mm-hmm. USPSA can be a little overwhelming to new shooters. You know, they see guys with five or six magazines on their belt, and you know, giant magwells and and compensators and red dots and all kinds of you know other gear. And, uh, you know, athletic shoes and, 
you know, everybody's wearing the, you know, the, the moisture wicking jerseys with a bunch of colors and, and things like that on them. So it becomes a little overwhelming a lot of times for a new shooter to go to a USPSA match. And then they step up on a, like a 16 target, 32 round array stay, you know, field course. And they go, um, yeah, I'm not for sure what to do first here. Whereas mm-hmm. an IDPA, you know, there's, there's a few, a few more limits in place to kind of make it a little bit more, uh, a little more digestible for, you know, for, yeah. for, for newer shooters as well. So, um, but yeah, no, I'm, I, I, to be honest, I really don't have like a, a, a preference per se. I love this more than I do that. I, mm-hmm. I, I do like USPSA, I think a little bit more just because of the freedom. Um, but again, I like the, I like IDPA as well because it's, it's more, it's more conclusive for newer shooters at, mm-hmm. a, at you know, at a, at an earlier start. Well, I can see that, and and it's funny here when Eric and I first started competing. It I wasn't even aware of any USPSA matches, mm-hmm. so yeah, it was all IDPA, and so that's what we naturally went into. And I'll tell you, I've never shot a USPSA match yet. Um, as I literally yesterday grabbed them, grab one of my my moleskin notebooks and, and got on practice score <laughs> and s- started looking at all the matches in my area mm-hmm. and writing out a calendar to decide where I could go. And, and I, I doubt it'll be more than a month before I hit my first USPSA match. Excellent. But you know, I, I know I'm going to, I need to do a little research. So again, I don't feel overwhelmed going in there. I will say but, the, the Tulsa folks, um, especially Chad Stanton and Kelly Raglan, uh, those guys have been, um, super supportive and, and help match direct all of the, the Tulsa level matches, um, out at USSA, um, mm-hmm. at us shooting Academy there. Yep. I've known Chad and, and Kelly and, and a lot of those guys, you know, in the Tulsa area for a number of years. Um, also to include like Eric Fusen, um, uh, Mike Seeklander, who is obviously one of my most near and dear friends as well as oh, yeah. mentors. Um, you know, Mike used to be the director of training at U.S. Shooting Academy for a number mm-hmm. of years um, and has competed in the Tulsa area for, gosh, forever. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, you've got you got some great talent there to really build some great stages and and learn a lot from the sport from, you know, just in that area. Yeah, it, it's it, it is pretty amazing. Um, I, I know there's great shooters all over the place, but it, I kind of feel like we've got some extra special guys around here. I may be wrong, but you know, th- there's, there's a lot of people to learn from. And, mm-hmm. and of course that, that love making sure people have matches. So I'll, I'll so d- does Kelly Raglan um, still run the, the USPS, the I USPSA? I don't know if Kelly really does. I know Chad Stanton was there for a long time. He was also the Area 4 director for USPSA um, mm-hmm. for a number of years. Um, I think he's he's since stepped down, but I know he still shoots locally there in Tulsa mm-hmm. and helps out a lot with the, uh, with the Tulsa matches there at USSA. Good deal. Well, and... And USSA is my my range. I literally, w- what's cool is I work a mile from the range. Oh, that's awesome. So lately, I've just been at 9 p.m., 10 p.m. at night loading mags. And I'll, I'll run down there at lunch and, you know, not a ton of rounds, but I'll, I'll have some solid um, goals of what I want to work on and, and go through 200 rounds, yeah. well-spent rounds on my lunch hour. And that saves me the hour long drive back and forth, which isn't a big deal, but man, it's really cool. being I'm going to go down there at lunch. And like I said, I literally did it yesterday. Absolutely. But, um, and man, that's a great range too. Um, it is. if I mean, I, it, I assume that it's at least from a amount of bays, um, it has to be one of the better ranges in the country. Well, they held, I mean, they held USPSA nationals there a few times. Um, they've also held the area four championships there multiple, multiple times. Uh, the Oklahoma state championships, uh, USPSA state championships were held there, um, or possibly still are held there. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, yeah, they, I mean, the USSA has been a, been a, been a pretty big range for a number of years you know, uh, yeah, I believe, I believe maybe about three years ago, they, they had, um, IDPA nationals there too. Mm-hmm. So yeah, there's, a, there's a lot going on there. 
Well, that's interesting. Um, it, it is nice when people are more open minded because because the whole closed minded thing in all of this stuff j- just gets old. Agree, <laughs> you know. But, um, so, man, let's let's go ahead and and talk some fun stuff. We've got some, you know, some learn on with with your competition, um, you know, skills and 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 um, suggestions and. It's and I'm telling you, I'm going to listen back to this and and put it all in my head. But you know, I, I do want to say this. It's it's funny. I think so many shooters, even you know, I'm just a decent local match guy. But that my mantra has been recently, literally, grip the gun hard and and um, pace yourself. Right. Because and and the reason why is lately. I'm, I'm trying to outrun myself. Mm-hmm. And so, um, and you can tell me if you think that, that I'm, I'm holding myself back by doing that, but it, it's, I mid match, I reminded myself of those two things. And I sh- shot the second half of the match as good as I've ever shot a second half of a match or, or a sing a whole match. But I, I, I think, that mantra may change a little bit as I get better, but I think that I just find it very interesting. The grip, the gun thing I think is always going to be in there. Sure. Because it's like, it's like a lot of technical things fall from that grip or, or flow from the grip. So that's cool. Well, so let's, let's, Let's geek a little bit about gear because, man, you you've always got some badass pistols, and and sometimes um, share pictures of some that I'm just real jealous about. But so, what what's your current favorite pistol to shoot these days? Um, gosh, I've spent probably the most time behind um, my Nighthawk double stack gun. So I've got a Nighthawk signature double stack, you know, a 2011 style pistol, nine uh, millimeter. Um, with a hollow sun 507 comp that I've had on it now for a bit. That's probably been the gun that I've spent the most time behind this season. Um, I've, I've shot three area matches, uh, USPSA, you know, area like national level matches with it. Um, and just got back from area. What match was I just shooting area eight in Pennsylvania? Um, and also Illinois sectional that same weekend. So I flew out to Onalani, Pennsylvania shot area eight and then flew to Illinois and then shot the Illinois sectional and then flew home. Um, Illinois sectional, I did really, really well on, uh, the, actually the, the area eight match, I finished second overall in, uh, oh, cool. in limited optics. And then in Illinois, I won, uh, I won limited optics there. So I won the championship. Rock there. on. Um, that's been the gun. Like I said, that's been my kind of my go-to this year. Um, I just put it back in the safe now to focus all of my attention on USPSA single stack nationals, which is coming up uh, towards the end of October or middle of October. So I basically got a month, the month of September to really train up um, and kind of get back in the saddle again with uh, with a single stack 1911s. Um, and so like my, my go-to gun now um, is, is one of my Nighthawk nine millimeter 1911s. I'll be shooting single stack minor in. And uh, so I've just spent two days on the range the last couple of days here at home uh, practicing, kind of getting back, like I said, kind of getting back on the saddle again. Um, you know, reloads galore, um, focusing on mm-hmm. one handed shooting, uh, strong hand and support hand only. And then just, you know, just, just getting comfortable behind that pistol again with iron sights. So. Yeah. It's, it's that, that's what I was going to ask you. Um, it, I was assuming that, that it was a iron sight it is um, gun, and and is that all? That sounds like it's always the case with single stack yeah. national. Single stack, you're only allowed, you know, uh, f- uh, single or uh, a single stack is only allowed like 1911 pattern pistols, and um, they're not allowed to have any kind of por- ports or compensators or anything like that on it, um, and you're not allowed any kind of uh, optic or electronic sights on them. It has to be iron sights. Well, it, y- yesterday. I brought out my old, very old, beat up, ugly duckling Glock 17 that I've had about 20 years and it had it only has irons on it. Well, you may have heard me talk about the fact that I have um, synthetic lenses now and mm-hmm. I had to go to all red dots at, on my carry guns mm-hmm. because indoors 
that it, it's irresponsible for me to rely on on irons. But yesterday was the first time I shot irons um, in two years, and man, I was I was kind of like man, I, I was actually shooting better. Mm-hmm. Then with my daughter, and it made me think, you know what? I think I may be over confirming with my daughter. Oh, something. absolutely. absolutely. So, As most people it, do. Oh, interesting. But it, I came away thinking, man, I, I can't see these sights near as well, but I'm shooting it better. But, you know, it's like, hello, old friend. I'm going to, I'm going to, I think the next match I go to, I may shoot irons or for the practice shoot. Um, carry optics and then you know maybe esp or something yeah just so i can i can run irons now okay so you brought up the hollow sum 507 con mm-hmm. I, i've texted you a couple times about that i think so you're what reticle i'm curious uh, are you using on that one so believe it or not i'm, I'm i've been pretty well um adhering to just the two uh the two moa dot on oh wow one. yeah um just and so my the majority of my reasoning is because I think on the 507 competition they're asking the emitter to do too many functions. So they've mm. got the 8 MOA ring, they've got the 20 MOA ring, and they've got the 32 MOA ring and the 2 MOA dot and then a combination of the dots and the rings and the rings and the rings and and everything else. And unfortunately, the rings themselves tend to ghost image. So it's like, I'll have a hard Mm. ring and then kind of just off to the side, slightly different image of a ring. Um, that's, it's kind of more faded, kind of a ghosting image um, behind that. So, um, and it's been that way with just about every 507 comp that I've picked up. Um, and so it's just been one of those things where it's like, you know what I need as little, I kind of need as, as little visual noise um, as possible. So I've just been working with the two MOA dot and just kind of running the dot. And I run the dot with at a very low setting, um, to, uh, to basically make it almost as translucent as I can so that I'm not drawn visually to looking at the dot. I'm able to just look through it. That, that's what I was about to ask. It, it sounds like that could, could help someone like me that, that may be over confirming. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Interesting. Now, and you know, I, I think that doesn't the SRO have kind of a ghosting thing that can happen too? Or, not, that, um, not that I've seen. Um, I ran an SRO for the first, you know, five months, six months uh, with that gun in limited optics and ran this just the 2.5 uh, MOA SRO. And it was a super crystal clear, you know, precise dot. Um, the only thing about that is like, I prefer a green dot more so than a red dot mm. and the SROs you, you, you can't get it anything but red. Mm. Um, but no, I mean, I, I never really had any issues with the SRO. The only thing with the SRO that you can get is base uh, is, is because of how the glass sits at a really, really steep angle in the, you know, in the optic frame, it's susceptible to picking up sunlight and reflecting sunlight that gives you a ghost image when you're able yeah, to that, that that's what I read about. You, thanks for refreshing my memory on, on exactly what the deal was with that. Yeah. Well, Tim, fun conversation. I, I, I'm you, you got to see how many notes I've written down here. <laughs> that's awesome. And, and, and because I mean, this is my focus now and, and I'm, it's, it's awesome being able to contact someone like you and, and Hey, selfishly have you on my show to, um, to pick your brain about my new, um, periodization focus as mm-hmm. in, in competition. So man, thanks again for coming on. It, it's, it's a blast talking to you. You're, um, you're very, um, giving of your knowledge and, and that means a lot to me and our listeners. Well, thank you. Now, before we let you go, I need to ask um, you to tell the listeners where they can get a hold of you. Um, so yeah, I mean the best best way to get a hold of me, honestly, is uh, through my website, which is timheronshooting.com. Pretty simple. Um, I've also got a YouTube channel, um, and I like to give away a lot of free, you know, free milk or free knowledge, so to speak, on my YouTube channel, which is also Tim Heron Shooting. Um, uh, I've got I'm on Instagram at Tim Heron Shooting. You see the trend here, um, mm-hmm. as well as of course just through, via Facebook. 
um, either Tim Heron, which is my personal page or Tim Heron shooting as well. Um, but yeah, I, I try to be the most accessible person I can, you know, as far as, if, you know, from an instructor or a coach. Um, and, and I love to, I love to, I love to geek out. I love to talk knowledge. I love to share things um, and love to help people, you know, is my, my number one goal is helping everybody become a, become a better shooter. So. Oh yeah. And you know what the cool thing is? I've found that the more giving I am of whatever I, I am helpful with, mm -hmm. the more I somehow get surrounded by guys like you and, and Mike Seaclander, Mike Brown and, and my favorite guitar players and stuff. It, it just goes on. If you're giving, man, it's amazing how many people um, you run into that are giving it their does. help. It's pretty absolutely damn cool. Does. Well, brother, you have a good evening and uh, have a have a safe flight out tomorrow. I believe you said you're heading heading to North Carolina. Nope, I'm headed to actually I'm heading to Los Angeles. So I'll be oh, in LA oh. uh, throughout the entire Labor Day weekend. So I'll fly out there tomorrow. I think I get in around noon or one, and I'm teaching a two day class on Saturday, Sunday, and then a follow up two day class on Monday and Tuesday before heading home for a single day on uh, Wednesday. And then flying back out again on Thursday to West Virginia to teach a match skills clinic on Friday and a two day practical performance class on Saturday and Sunday. So, yep, it's, it's sept, uh, August, September and October are very, very, very busy months for me. Oh, awesome. Well, it sounds like it. And uh, um, everybody um, from our team, of course, congratulates you on on um, your recent delve into the full-time instructor. You're doing a great job. And, and obviously, if you're having to fly around all over the place, there's some people that want to learn from you. So that's pretty cool. Well, buddy, you have a good evening. And again, thanks for coming on. Er and Eric, I'll, he's going to get mad at me if I didn't say anything. Er Eric said to tell you hi, and he's sorry he didn't get well, to come Well, please tell on. him I said hello as well. And Aaron, thank you for everything, guys. I appreciate it. All right, buddy. Good night. Good night.